UFC 305 betting and drafting show. We have 12 fights this Saturday. We're in Australia this weekend. I'm John Kelly. Let's hear the picks. Kicking things off in the flyweight division, we have Stuart Nickel coming in as a minus 230 favorite. The comeback on Jesus Aguilar is plus 190. And we'll start on the Nickel side. This is a guy, an 8-0 undefeated prospect. He's the local guy, so he'll have the home crowd pop behind him. The thing is, though, he just hasn't faced it anybody on the regional scene he's faced a very low level of competition so i certainly don't trust him at at a chalk price tag here but i do like a little bit of his game he's got some sharp leg kicks on the feet he's very aggressive in going to his wrestling he actually has some pretty solid wrestling it's kind of tough to gauge because the guys that he's facing in the grappling are just not very good quite frankly but i do think his takedowns are going to translate to a matchup like this against Jesus Aguilar, who's undersized for the division, who's very willing to accept takedowns and fight off his back. This is a guy that jumps guillotine more than Cody Brundage. Six of his 10 wins have come by submission. So this is one where I think Jesus Aguilar is probably going to need to pull off a sub in one of the scrambles to get the win here. And I just... I don't know. It's possible because Nicole's not that experienced, but I do think I just favor the pace and the aggressiveness, and I do think Nicole is going to be having the wrestling success. So I'm going to say it's Nicole by decision. That's the official pick. Which brings us to our next matchup as Song Kanan is coming in as a minus 175 favorite. The comeback on Ricky Glenn is plus 145, and there's actually been some movement towards the underdog in Ricky Glenn. Very surprising to me because Ricky Glenn's on a three-fight losing streak. He's coming off a first-round knockout loss to Drew Dober, and he's coming off back-to-back knockout losses. At 35 years old, the durability is certainly a concern. He's taken a lot of damage throughout the course of his career. This is a guy that's had, you know, injury issues as well. So it's a little bit concerning for me, especially when facing somebody that does have legitimate knockout power in Song Kanan. Kanan is not a high volume guy, but he is very powerful. Nine of his 21 wins have come by knockout. He's landed multiple knockdowns at the UFC level. And we've seen him at times even mix in a couple takedowns as well. Now, I don't think that'll be the game plan here against Ricky Glenn, who should have the grappling advantage. And I think if Glenn is going to be competitive here and maybe pull off the upset, I think it comes with grappling success. The thing is, I'm just not convinced that he's going to be able to have much of that in this fight. And I do think the likelihood that he gets hurt here is relatively high. So it's one where I'm kind of back and forth between a Kanan finish and decision. Ultimately, I'm going to side that it does go 15 minutes. But either way, I think Kanan is going to get his hand raised here. We'll say it's Song by decision. That's the official pick. Next fight up, we have Tom Nolan, who comes in as the most expensive fighter on the slate on DraftKings at 9,800. He's also the biggest betting favorite on the card at minus 1,200 with Alex Reyes on the comeback at plus 750. And this is a very obvious setup spot for my guy Tom Nolan here, who is coming off a first round uh, knockout victory, but... It didn't come without a little bit of adversity. He was dropped in that fight, which is a concern because he made his UFC debut against Nicholas Moda, who knocked him out when he was a big favorite. So now he's been dropped in back-to-back fights. He's never been a guy that has great striking defense. So that's always going to be a concern for him. The thing is, I just don't think it matters much in this type of matchup. He's facing somebody in Alex Reyes who, personally, I don't understand why is even still on the UFC roster. He's had two fights in the last seven years, and he was knocked out in the first round in both of them. He turns 38 years old in just two months. I just don't see a path to victory for him here. He's going to be much smaller than Nolan. Nolan's a much better striker, very aggressive in the clinch with those knees and elbows. And I just think it's very strong possibility that Nolan just blitzes him early and probably gets him out of there. We'll say it's Nolan by knockout in round one, and that's the official pick. The bigger decision is going to be whether or not you want to spend $9,800 for him on DraftKings because this is a slate where the mid-range is pretty solid, and there's not a ton of really cheap underdogs that I think are worth targeting, so it's going to be difficult to get the salary to get up to $9,800. That's going to be something we discuss more on the DraftKings deep dive show over at fightnumbers.com, so keep an eye out for that, but the official pick is Tom Nolan, 
by knockout in round one. And next fight up, we have what I think is another setup fight with Jack Jenkins, the local guy. He's a minus 800 favorite with Herbert Burns on the comeback at plus 550. And we know what Herbert Burns brings to the table. He's a very dangerous submission grappler, but he needs to tie you up early in order to try to submit you. Because if that doesn't happen, he's likely gassing out, getting hurt, and getting finished. He basically does that in all of his fights. So the one thing you have to worry about is getting caught by a sub early. And I just think Jack Jenkins is going to be well ready for that type of game plan. This is a guy that's coming off the fight against Chepe Mariscal, a fight that I thought he was clearly winning and on his way to win, but he suffered an injury, unfortunately. Um, So now he's getting a bounce back spot here. He's a very good striker, nasty leg kicks. He's finished a couple guys with those kicks on the regional scene. Uh, That's how nasty they are. And Herbert Burns, we know you can certainly take advantage of the legs. And Jack Jenkins is a well-rounded guy. He can go to the ground. He can stay safe in top position. I don't want him to do that, but if he does, I'm not like thinking that he's just instantly going to be submitted. Now, obviously, it would be smarter to keep the fight on the feet, just beat him up, and eventually take over as the fight goes on because Jenkins biggest edge in this fight is going to be in the cardio department. This guy pushes a pace. He can do so for 15 minutes. And I think at this point, we just know that Burns is unable to keep any type of pace over even 10 minutes. So I'm going to side with Jenkins here. Jenkins by TKO. That's the official pick. Next fight up, we have Luana Santos, a minus 148 favorite with Casey O'Neill on the comeback at plus 124. And we just saw Luana Santos fight Maria Agapova just one month ago. And she took her down and submitted her inside the first round. That's not really all that surprising, but now she's making a quick turnaround, flying halfway across the world on short notice to face somebody who's coming off uh, back-to-back losses, who's hungry and wants to get back in the win column, who's going to have a clear cardio advantage in Casey O'Neill. You know, she's a very high volume striker. Her defense is not good whatsoever, but she's fa- she's been facing much better competition than Luana Santos and she's somebody that's going to be moving forward for 15 minutes unless you have the power to stop her from doing that like an Ariana Lipsky. I don't see that power from Luana Santos. Can Santos land a couple takedowns? Maybe she comes from a high level judo background and Casey O'Neill has been put on bottom in the past but I'm less confident that she's going to be able to do that for 15 minutes here. I don't know if she's going to be able to do it at all to be honest and I think Casey O'Neill is going to be out pointing her on the feet especially as the fight goes on because of that cardio and volume advantage and the home crowd cheering every single time she lands a strike always helps as well as an underdog. So I'm going to side with my girl, Casey O'Neill. She's burned me in the past, but we're getting back in the win column this weekend. O'Neill by decision. That's the official pick. And next fight up, we have Josh Cullabau, a minus 148 favorite with Ricardo Hamos on the comeback at plus 124. And to be honest, man, I'm just done with Ricardo Hamos. Like the dude, he's he's got a ton of skill. He just, he's a flake, man. Like this guy, even when he has clear advantages, like he just finds ways to lose. And we know that he's just not gonna fight very hard if it's not going his way. So it's just really tough to trust a guy like that. And you're fighting someone in Josh Cullabau who I've never been personally that high on. I had a bet on Danny Silva his last time out who ended up edging a split decision win over Cullabau. But what Cullabau brings to the table is he's a moments fighter. He's not a good minute winner, but he has big moments because he does have power. He's capable of landing something big here. And Ricardo Hamos is just going to be trying his spinning stuff, low volume, maybe look to grapple but even when he does that he finds a way to end up you know in bad positions even against guys that aren't as good with him on the mat so I just think at some point Kalabau is going to show him the door and Hamos is going to look for a way out he's been finishing five of his six professional losses and I think this could be the next one we'll say it's Kalabau by TKO that's the official pick. And next up, we have Junior Taffa, a minus 135 small favorite with Walter Walker on the comeback at plus 114. Now, Junior Taffa is the brother of Justin Taffa. So he's going to be fighting in front of his home crowd here. On the flip side, we have Walter Walker, who's the brother of Johnny Walker. So it's brother versus brother here. Um, very interesting matchup. And honestly, what it comes down for me, like this is super binary matchup because on one hand you have junior taffa high level kickboxer allegedly 
does have some serious power though and can hurt you very one-dimensional has to keep the fight on the feet and land something big he's not even a high volume guy so it likely needs to come early because his ground game is an absolute disaster. You can take this guy down. He has no clue how to work back up to his feet. On the flip side, Walter Walker showed in his debut, he can get you down. He can control you, but he's not really doing much with it at times. And also, you have to worry about the cardio with him as well because he certainly slows an extended fight. So this is one where... I could see it going either way, but with how bad Junior Tafa's defensive wrestling and grappling is, I have to favor the guy that I think is going to be able to get the fight where he needs it, and that's going to be Walter Walker. He does look a little bit more lean this time around as well, so that always helps. So that could help with the uh, cardio department. So I'm going to side with Walker here. We'll say he gets it done. Walker, by decision. That's the official pick. And next up, we have Carlos Prates, a minus 340 favorite. The comeback on Jing Liang Li is plus 270. And this is an interesting matchup because Prates has always been somebody that I kind of think the market is overrating. Like even on Contender Series, I bet against him with Mitch Ramirez, which ended up being a total disaster and a bad bet. But basically since then, my, my opinion of him hasn't changed. He's a very good striker, solid kickboxer, comes from a high-level Muay Thai background. He trains out of the fighting nerds, which we know is basically the best camp out there right now. But I just still think there's holes in his game that better fighters are going to be able to take advantage of. And we've kind of seen bits and pieces of it. Trevin Giles, one round one, gets instantly knocked out in round two. Protes, he's a low-volume guy. Even though the striking is very good, great body kicks, nice knees up the middle, etc. But I just think you could take this guy down. I think you can out-volume him. Trevin Giles was out-striking him. Trevin Giles is a good boxer, don't get me wrong. But now, as he continues to be facing these better and better guys in the division, I think at some point, somebody's going to be able to capitalize on some of these holes. Now, can Jing Lang Lee be that guy? I think he could, potentially, because he's very well-rounded. You know, he's a good striker, lots of movement which I think could give Prates issues. And he also has shown he can mix in the grappling. He averages 1.25 takedowns per 15 minutes. Now, where I have concerns with Jing Lang Li is that he's coming off almost a two-year layoff. He last fought at USC 279, and he's had some injury issues in that span. Now, he's not old quite yet, but he's not a spring chicken either. So it is kind of concern, you know, ring rust can come into play and that sort of thing, but he is a very durable fighter. He's a good striker, like I mentioned, and he might be able to mix in the wrestling. So I think those things alone kind of make him the value side in this matchup because zero shot, I'm laying it with Carlos Prates at minus 340. I think that's terrible. Um, but in terms of DraftKings, I'm going to lean towards the underdog as well, even though I think more times than not, Protest maybe has the bigger moments and gets his hand raised. So for the sake of a pick, I'm going to say it's Protest by decision. But I think the value is clearly on the underdog. I just think there's probably too many questions or concerns at this point for me to get too heavily involved. And next fight up, we have Jerzinho Rosenstruck, a minus 218 favorite with Tai Toivasa on the comeback at plus 180. And... I mean, I always root for Bam Bam, Tui Vasa. I want to see the shoey. He's fighting in front of his home crowd. He's on a, a big losing streak now, too. He's coming off a first-round submission loss to Marcin Tybora his last time out. But let's be honest, Tui Vasa never grapples. He, he doesn't know how to grapple. It wasn't that big of a surprise that Tybora was able to finish it once the fight got there. Now, this is a much better matchup for him because Rosenstruck has no interest in grappling. So I think both of these guys are going to want to stand and bang. And I think if that's the case, Tui Vasa is going to be live to land some of those big heavy shots. He's a very powerful guy. All he needs is one or two big shots to put your lights out. And on the flip side, Rosenstruck is coming off a main event win over Shamil Gaza. Asiev. The fight numbers crew was on him very big in that spot. He was around plus 140, plus 150-ish against Shamil Gaziev. Total bum, total un unproven guy in extended fights. And Rosenstruck just completely outclassed him down the stretch. Gaziev basically just quit on the duel as well. So um, I just think this is kind of an overcorrection to that because Rosenstruck looked great his last time out. But let's not forget Rosenstruck, he's been dropped. He's been knocked out before. And these guys are going to want to keep it on the feet and stand and bang. So even though I think Rosenstruck is the cleaner technical kickboxer, sharp leg kicks, good counter striker as well. 
I think at some point it's just going to be an ugly swinging war. And I think Bam Bam kind of thrives in those spots unless you have, you know, the Sergey Pavlovich, the Derek Lewis level of power. And I just don't think that Rosenstruck quite has that anymore. He's more of not a point fighter, but he definitely plays it safe in a lot of these fights. So um, I'm going to side with Bam Bam here. I think there's value on the underdog. We'll say it's Toy Vasa by knockout. That's the official pick. Next up, we have Mateus Gamra, a minus 340 favorite with Dan, the hangman hooker at plus 270 on the comeback. And I've, I've picked a few of the local guys throughout this card, actually most of them. I'm not going to pick Dan Hooker. I think it's possible that he can pull off an upset here. You know, he's a powerful striker. He's infamous for those knees, those nasty knees. And he's facing a very aggressive wrestler who does get dropped in a lot of his fights in Mateus Gamron. But I also think that even though Hooker historically has good takedown defense by the numbers, you've also seen when he's facing the better wrestlers, Michael Chandler, like he's effortlessly throwing him around. Not that I think Gamrot is just instantly going to do that because he's not really as strong as Michael Chandler, but he is a good wrestler and he is able to close distance and land multiple takedowns. And even though I worry that sometimes he's not doing enough damage, I do think it's going to be enough. You know, the constant mat returns. It's not that his striking is that bad either, but I do favor Hooker in the striking. It's just that I think there's going to be too much takedowns, control time, enough to give Hooker uh, the benefit here when it goes to the judges' scorecard. So I'm going to side with Gamrot here. Gamrot by decision. That's the official pick. Next fight up, we have Steve Ursig, a minus 162 favorite. The comeback on Kai Kara France is plus 136. And we'll start on the Ursig side. This is a guy who just fought for the title against Alexander Pantoja, and he fought him very close. You know, some people were like, oh, he was robbed. Um, very competitive fight. I think he did lose that fight, but he certainly gave a good account of himself. And this is a guy that just has a very well-rounded skill set on the feet. He's a solid striker. He seems to be very durable as well. And and we know he can push the grappling. You know, prior to the UFC, he was basically just a grappler looking to grapple in a lot of his fights. Now, I don't think he's going to have much grappling success in this matchup because Kai Car France historically is very difficult to take down and even harder to control if you take him down. Kai Car France has also faced the best of the best for this division. He's a very good striker. He's very durable in his own right. And I just think he's going to be getting the better of the striking exchanges. And because I don't think Ursig is going to be able to have much grappling sex, if at all, I'm going to side with Kai Car France in what should be a very close fight. Again, the home crowd narrative sort of playing into that. If I think the fight is basically 50-50, I'm going to use the home crowd narrative as the tiebreaker here. I know Ursig is from that part of the world as well, but it's certainly going to be a home home crowd for uh, Car Car France here, and I think he gets it done. We'll say it's Car France by decision. That's the official pick. Which brings us to our main event, which is currently lined as a pick and We have Israel Adesanya taking on Dreykus Duplessis. Now, Duplessis captured the middleweight strap when he fought Sean Strickland back in January. Many people were kind of surprised by that. He was just basically able to outpace Sean Strickland, beat him at his own game. He landed six takedowns in that fight as well. Now, Duplessis is just a madman in there. He wants to move forward, swing these crazy combinations, and try to take your head off. But as we've seen, he's also got a pretty solid ground game as well. Now, where I worry about Duplessis is... Not, not really with the cardio because he proved against Strickland he can not only go five rounds, but he could push a pace for 25 minutes. So I'm just expecting the cardio to be there. But I worry about the striking defense because even though he hasn't been finished all that much, he's been dropped a bunch. He's been stung a bunch. And it's because his striking defense is not very good and he overextends on a lot of his combinations. And I just worry because Israel Adesanya not only is a little bit hungrier at this stage, you know, he lost a strap. Now he's getting it back. They have their um, African beef that they have going on. And I just think Izzy's going to be the much better counter striker in this matchup. I think Duplessis, that kind of his style, his moving forward, his constant aggression, it kind of plays well into Izzy's game because I think those check left hooks are going to be there all day. Izzy's going to have a four inch reach advantage in this spot as well. He He's got some of the best leg kicks in the game. He's He can fight moving backwards. I just think he's going to be countering Duplessis basically the entire fight and eventually landing a big shot or two that probably swings rounds. So I'm going to side with Izzy here. I think he gets the strap back. We'll say it's Israel Adesanya by decision. 
that's the official pick. And as always, guys, fightnumbers.com will have my DraftKings player rankings. It'll have my ownership projections as well. We have the live odd screen. We have the picks from Pepe, Evan, and Ozzy, a bunch of other tools, some free, some behind the paywall. But either way, go check it out. And this week only, if you use promo code 305, you guys loved the pay-per-view promotions we ran in the past. So we're doing it this week only, now through Saturday. Use promo code 305 for 30.5% off your first payment. That works for both monthly and annual packages. As always, thanks for watching. Best of luck, and we'll see you guys next time.